everyone. If you're still getting a sandwich, that's cool. Just come sit down when you can. Um, but we're going to start. Um, so welcome to Uncover. Thank you for coming. It's so great to see you all here. Um, I'm Joanna. This is Luke. And we're from the CU. Um, uh, just before we start, the fire exits are here and here and the door that you came through. Um, so we're going to have a look at the poll, I think. Um, yep. So 57% of you think that there is truth in a post-truth world. Um, so that's what um, Christy's going to be talking about. Yeah, so Christy's going to come, us, come up to us and basically answer this question for us. Um, and... If you have any questions while you're listening to the talk and you want to maybe get them answered, then you can send them in. If you go to the same place where you would go for the poll, then there's another tab where you can click on questions and you can send in questions. Uh, and you can do that if you just follow this link. Um, so I'd like to welcome Christy. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome today. I was um, a little bit concerned for the tent sitting over here and like seeing all the screen shaking, so uh, hopefully this will be a nice place to spend this afternoon. Welcome. So yes, we're going to think about uh, the question, is there truth in a post-truth world? Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear the word post-truth, I just feel exhausted by it. It's been in the media, it's been um, online, you know, we hear Theresa May trying to sort out all sorts of different uh, deal, no deals for us, and it is utterly exhausting. So perhaps you're here today and you just feel exhausted when you think about the word truth and you hear the word post-truth. If that's you, I'm glad you're here because I hope we can add a little bit of nuance to how we understand truth today. Or perhaps you're here and you're not only exhausted, but you're also just utterly confused. You know, your head is spinning with the current political climate. You know, and you're just unsure, really, how to actually process truth claims rightly. If that's you, I hope that today we'll find a better way of approaching knowledge. Or perhaps you're here and uh, you very much doubt it's even possible to know anything truly. Maybe you think that the only truth that you, that you, that we have access to, is the meaning that we create for ourselves and that we apply to the world. If that's you, I hope today we might just start thinking about a truth which might free us. Or perhaps you're here today and you're like one of my, um, my friends who's a German existentialist philosopher. Uh, and he says that Christianity is nothing but a cognitively empty ghost story. Perhaps you think similar. If that's you, I hope today we'll see some of the content of truth. Or perhaps you're here and actually you're all of those things. You're feeling weary, you're feeling exhausted, you're skeptical, you're confused, you're uncertain. And you wish, you hope, that there may, there might be a way forward. Is there truth in a post-truth world? Let's see, shall we? So here are some big questions. Questions like, whom can we trust? What is real? How do we know? These questions are deeply personal. What we need is something that is no less than factual, but is so much more. Something which accounts for our coming to know and the ongoing relationship that we have with knowledge. And that is really the big, big thing that I'd love to suggest to you today, is that knowledge is relational. Truth is relational. We do not need to confine truth to the realm of the philosophers, though, you know, it's quite a fun and interesting place to start. Instead, what I hope we can do is start to think about and share a truth that is real, a healthy epistemology, a way of knowing, which affects all areas of life and being. But before we do that, we need to have a little think about, you know, defining our terms. What is post-truth? And what is the effect that it's actually had on knowledge today? Now, I'm sure we can all remember the Brexit slogans from not so long ago, and I'm not going to repeat them, you know, ad nauseum, other than to say that very much was promised, and very little, probably, has been delivered since. If nothing else, the EU referendum has revealed to us this most frustrating question. How can we recognise when someone is telling us the truth? 
How do we know that it's really trustworthy? People promise much, and they actually deliver quite little. They spin, they weave, and they deceive for personal advancement and for gain. And most people, and that probably includes a fair few of us, may feel lied to, let down, perhaps even betrayed. If we or other fellow citizens voted either leave or remain on the basis of, on the basis of, of faulty information on such a, a significant issue, how can we know that what we hear in the future will provide an accurate representation of reality? When Michael Gove was challenged by a Sky News reporter to name a single independent economic authority who thought that Brexit was a good idea, he made this expert comment. You may remember it. He said, I think people in this country have had enough of experts. And this sentiment, it's felt on the other side of the pond as well, isn't it? You know, I'm, hopefully I'm in a safe space here, but I love it whenever the American elections roll around. You know, I, I take the next day off, kind of stay up late into the night, listen and hear each state kind of call in with some friends and good food, a bit of wine. But uh, we were in for a bit of a shock, weren't we, a few years ago? I don't know if you're watching it. You know, I wonder how many of us maybe awoke the next morning and we got that little notification on our screens that declared Trump as president-elect. Such moments, I'm sure, however you feel about him, we'll remember for a very long time to come. And, you know, as I was watching each state declare and the world received such news that Trump had received the 70% necessary to win, one of the British news reporters said live on TV, I don't know how we got this so wrong. Why didn't we pick this up? The majority of people who voted for Trump were fed up with Washington. Washington doesn't work, they said. They wanted an outsider, someone untainted by Washington and its politic, someone who hadn't been corrupted by power. As Trump's campaign, and indeed like his presidency since, it's constantly changed, and you know, more and more untrue facts were made. I think they're generally called lies. Words have increasingly bore very little relation to reality. So if the sole purpose of the media is to expose lies, and to discern between fact and fiction, they couldn't do it. Post-truth erodes knowledge. Politicians have failed us, presidents have failed us, the liberal media has failed us. And these are just the events of the past you know, couple of years or so. It's not limited to the political sphere, is it? You know, how about people like Jimmy Savile, or the football coach, Barry Bunnell? or just awful instances of clerical abuse. People who were and are in positions of power and authority, whom we trust, who have responsibility, whom we believe, and they let us down. It turns out even they have been deceiving us to such abhorrent effect. How about the financial crisis? You know, the Western world put its trust in the economists and the economists let us down. And now, as technology advances, is cyberspace really that secure? What happened to all the information that has been repeatedly hacked into and withdrawn, you know, from Yahoo accounts, banks, or Tesco? Because this is what the world looks like in our post-truth society. We are left with the question, who can we trust? By the way, if you have a spare three hours, I highly recommend a, uh, an iPlayer documentary called Hypernormalization by Adam Curtis. He basically kind of charts the history of post-truth. Fascinating. But perhaps uh, you saw this article in The Guardian. Again, you know, the word post-truth has been used so often in the wake of the US election and EU referendum that the Oxford English Dictionary declared post-truth to be its international word of the year in 2016. Now, most recently, we've seen words like Antifa, fake news, alternative facts, and they've been used quite f freely and frequently, haven't they? Now, here are just some of the, the situations of our post-truth climate. But again, it's really helpful to define what actually is post-truth. I think it's going to come up now. This is one way of looking at it. It's where objective facts are less influential than shaping, in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. 
So really, you know, it's no wonder that when facts no longer influence, and perhaps they never purely should have done, appeals to emotion and personal belief do. Washington doesn't work. Our country has had enough of experts. We know that they're lying, and we don't care. Or do we? That is the effect that post-truth has on knowledge. We expect people to lie, and we probably know that they are, but we're just used to it. Now, such a disintegration of truth leads to a disintegration of trust. Jonathan Haidt, you may have come across him, social psychologist, uh, named one of the uh, 65 world thinkers of 2013. And he recognized this in his studies a little while ago. In 2006, he released the book, The Happiness Hypothesis. And he starts out by looking at different ways in which the self has been divided and he zooms in on the distinction between reasoned processes and automatic emotional processes. So he says it's a little bit like this elephant up here. There's a little rider on the back of this massive elephant in which the rational mind is the rider and the emotional mind is the elephant. And the problem is, is that the rational rider's control isn't exactly determinative. The rider is so small compared to the emotional elephant. So anytime there's a disagreement between the two, the rider is always going to lose. The elephant will always overpower the rider. Now, you may have experienced this. <laughs> if you've committed to getting fit and actually you just thought, hey, I'll just walk around Warwick Campus for a little bit. Got a long way to go to those car parks. Or if you've slept in, or if you've overeaten, you know, if you've called your ex at midnight, if you've abandoned your German or your piano lessons, or perhaps you've just refused to speak up in seminars because you were too scared, and so on. The elephant is led purely by emotional and conscious instinct. It wants what it wants, when it wants it. And that little stick that the rider is using to try and prod the elephant into action, it's not going to work. Now, I think this quite accurately reflects the nature of our post-truth context. Some tweets are going to come up. Um, this is hopefully someone who tweeted a little while ago. Um, hashtag, it's unacceptable too. Tell other people what to do. And uh, here's a friend of mine tweeting an irony in response to the Oxford English Dictionary definition. Bloody OED experts telling the rest of us what the word of the year was. Post-truth, next they'll be telling us that they write the dictionary. Where there is such a disintegration of truth, when the rider doesn't know how to think, there is a disintegration of trust. The rider refuses to listen to the experts and vice versa. And whilst that's going on, the elephant is just getting more and more frustrated. And, it's going, and it goes on a rampage, harnessing all of its energy and drive to pursue instant gratification of felt needs. Okay, disintegration of truth leads to disintegration of trust. And I think truth and trust and people are linked very closely together indeed. We trust people, don't we, who we think are truthful. So it's unsurprising then that when any kind of abuse happens in, in power or authority, that that will lead to not only such abhorrent and awful acts, but it also leads us to distrust who the people or organizations are and what they stand for. In a post-truth climate, then, it is no wonder that we regard certain truth claims with such a high level of suspicion. And rightly so. You know, there's that old adage, isn't there, that the, uh, the people who are the most wrong are the most certain. And we can say that the more, more certain they are, the more dangerous they become. And this statement, it just, again, it feeds our elephants, doesn't it? If certainty is associated with danger, then I want nothing to do with that. And that is a fair point. You know, if, if Trump or others are confident in their claim that the way to solve the problem of so-called Islamic State is by pushing the nuclear button, then I really wouldn't want much to do with that. Just as much as I and probably all of you here wouldn't endorse or support confidence in the so-called Islamic State's political agenda. There's such confident certainty on both sides, and yet certainty doesn't overcome or remove the prior certainty in this case. It just produces more danger. It's like Adam Curtis's um, other documentary, Bitter Lake. The Americans were so certain that they went into Iraq thinking that they knew what was best, and then they tragically realized that they had absolutely no idea, and they didn't know how to sort it out. 
people now are seeing that there's this vacuum of meaning. So then, how can we be confident about what we know when everyone seems to be pulled by their elephants all over the place? Is good confidence in what is true even possible? And before we get there, I think we need to ask a much more basic question. How do we know? How do we go about the process of knowing anything? I'm just going to share with you one story of knowing before presenting what I think is a fuller, better, more real, and ultimately good way of knowing. Now, there are lots of people that we could focus on throughout philosophical history. There are many stories which explain how we can know anything. Sorry, I'm losing my voice. Um, but due to time, we're just going to look at one, because I think this guy is usually the first to come to mind when we think about epistemology, or the study of how we know. And his work has left the biggest stain on the way that we approach knowledge. Now, here he is. You've probably guessed it. It's Big Daddy Descartes. Now, we've probably all heard of the conclusion of his thought experiment, haven't we? You know, cogito ergo sum, I'm thinking, therefore I am. Descartes is a rationalist and a foundationalist, meaning that in order to know what is real, we need to know how such a claim can be a justified true belief. Now, please do come and chat with me after it, afterwards about this if you're interested. It's, it's, it's juicy, juicy stuff. But basically, Descartes said that in order to know anything with certainty, babe, thanks, in order to know anything with certainty, we have to start to doubt everything we know. And by doing this, we might be able to see that there is some belief that cannot be doubted. So basically, he just sits in front of a fire <laughs> with a few drinks, and he starts to doubt for a very long time. And now we're not going to go through his meditations, but they're a highly trippy read. I recommend them if you have some time. But ultimately, he lands on that conclusion. I'm thinking, therefore I am. I can doubt the external world. I can doubt that I have a body. I can doubt that my reasoning abilities can be trusted. And there may be good reason to think that all of my other beliefs are false because they've been manipulated by an evil power. But there is one belief that he says we cannot be mistaken about. And that is the belief that we are thinking that we are doubting as we do that. So since we are thinking, there must be something that does the thinking, me. So the I is the thinking thing. Thinking, he says, proves that we exist. Critics, of course, have come up with a number of ways to show that this construction of knowing is problematic. Um, here's one. His claim that we should limit knowledge there we go. He's saying that we should limit knowledge only to that which we are absolutely certain is much too limited. It makes perfect sense to say that we know things without having to guarantee that what we know is based on an indubitable foundation. Because it also throws up problems about belief in, in other minds. If I know that I exist right now, how do I also know that you exist? I'd also argue that not only is Descartes' view limited, but in light of that, it's also necessarily reductionistic. It limits reality, and it doesn't make any room for the elephant. We all have feelings, desires, longings, emotions, and these aren't accounted for as justified true beliefs in this schema. So, even though Descartes' enterprise has been shown by and large to have failed, it still remains quite a potent thought exercise and it hasn't been disregarded by any means. In fact, Descartes just goes on to pave the way for other stories of knowing, such as skepticism, you know, the view that there cannot be any justified beliefs. And into that vat of competing theories of knowledge, we find evidentialist approaches, we find purely scientific, empirical approaches, and then you get your oddballs like Immanuel Kant, who, who just comes up with his own theories. But now, please don't mishear me. I'm not saying that evidence, reason, science are bad ways of knowing. They aren't. We would still be flat earthers if we didn't take evidence seriously. You know, we wouldn't value this discussion itself if we didn't value reason. And we wouldn't have penicillin if we disregarded science. Pascal, he makes a very helpful comment on this. I'll let you read it. Hopefully it's going to come up. We know the truth not only through our reason, but also through our heart. 
And then he finishes, as if reason were the only way we could learn. So I'm definitely not saying that reason, science and evidence are bad ways of knowing. They just aren't the only way of knowing. What I'd like to raise is this question. How can we even know that we can have confidence in any of these approaches? And to answer that, I think we need to understand how an atheist worldview speaks into this discussion. If it's true, as some have said, that the universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at bottom, no design, no meaning, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference, then how can I trust that my own thoughts and beliefs are geared towards truth? If we are just the product of time plus chance plus matter, then how can I trust that my own thoughts and beliefs are geared towards truth? In other words, it doesn't matter you know, if one takes an empiricist account of knowing or a rationalist account, because with atheism, the person cannot even trust their own faculties, such as perception, memory, reason, and so on, to be reliable. Unguided evolution has to give a non-theistic evolutionary account that the origin of these faculties is aimed at forming true beliefs. Evolution only selects for survival and reproduction. It doesn't select for truth. And this is the argument that philosopher Plantinga gives in his recent book, Where the Conflict Really Lies. He writes this, all that's required for survival and fitness is that the neurology cause adaptive behavior. This neurology also determines belief content. But whether or not that content is true makes no difference to fitness. David Talcott is at King's University. He later added to this conversation and said, no doubt if naturalism, that's the belief that everything arises from natural properties and causes, is true, then the belief forming mechanisms in our brains would have to be the ones which help us survive and reproduce. But why think they would also be aimed at truth? So if atheism is right, and if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no meaning, no God creating or providentially superintending the development of these faculties, then the atheist, according to Plantinga, has a hard time explaining why we should listen to them about science, reason, and evidence. Now again, please don't mishear me. I do think that those who adhere to an atheist worldview deserve to be listened to, and they make all kinds of really valuable contributions um, to many fields. But this is just the logical outworking of the atheist worldview. It can't account for the desire for truth or truth itself. And then the other reason why we can't have confidence in these approaches as totalizing accounts of knowing is because, again, they're all necessarily limited. And for that reason, they're also usually self-refuting. For example, you know, the scientists claim that all I can know is what I can see, test, and repeat is itself a claim that can't fulfill its own criteria. Or, for example, if all I can know is that which is evident to the senses isn't itself evident to the senses... We can't separate the rider from the elephant or vice versa. We need a way of knowing that accounts for both. So what post-truth has actually shown us is that emotions matter. Emotions can be manipulated, but as Haidt has shown us, most of us are led by our elephants an awful lot of the time. So it's important that we are, as it were, emotional about the right things. How can we persuade our elephants to pursue good, hearty things? And a lot of this, there's much to say on this, but I just want to highlight that emotions, the realm of the heart, matters. And so I think that we need, what we need is not only something that can give ground, weight, and legs to our longings and our desires, but something that can actually satisfy our hunger for truth, that corresponds to reality, that we can be confident in. I'd like to suggest that we need both. We need both head and heart. And for the biblical writers, there has never been a disjunction between the two. So what Jonathan Haidt is proposing here has actually been around for thousands of years in the biblical literature set forth by God. Now, I'd like to suggest a different way of knowing. 
Hopefully, I think she might come up. Esther Lightcat Meek, she's a professor of philosophy at Geneva College in Western Pennsylvania. And she's kind of developed this guy called Michael Polanyi, his, his approach to knowing, which gives us an account of knowing that makes sense of our coming to know and our ongoing relationship with knowledge. Now, she proposes something, it's a little bit of a mouthful, she proposes something called subsidiary focal integration. We won't have time to go into this now, but please ask questions if you're interested. Essentially, knowing is like the twisting of a kaleidoscope. You know, one minute it's really fuzzy and quite chaotic, but then gradually, as it, as it shifts, these fuzzy things come together to form a pattern. So we no longer focus on like the blobs of color, but we now see this pattern emerging. And as we rely on those blobs of color, we are then able to form that bigger picture that has come together for us. Now, the other, the other fundamental pitfall to Descartes was the fact that he assumed that he was able to perceive objective reality and truth truly. As though he's on the outside looking in, as though he's above looking down. And from that point, he can rightly assess and discern truth in toto. But what Meek is suggesting here is that knowing is indwelled. So we, we rely on these clues, on these bodily clues, to point us to bigger and larger patterns. We don't have the full picture. There is a coming to know, which isn't accounted for by Descartes. Now, what is unique about Meek's approach is not only her development of this, but that her fundamental starting point is, she argues for her as a Christian, love. She says this, she says, this starting point is the watershed difference between the knowledge as information approach and the loving to know approach to knowing. Knowing ventures, she argues, begin out of love or desire. And this is what Brian Cox in a recent symposium with David Wilkinson called a love of nature. He said, wonder is noticing that there's something beautiful and worth exploring about nature, and that's the act of wonder. And then you go off and explore it in whatever way you choose. If you really want to understand how a blade of grass works, the only way you're going to do it is by doing science. You won't do it by contemplating it. There are responses to the universe. A piece of art is a response. Music is a response. Theology and philosophy are responses. But the initial act of being interested and noticing something that's worth exploring is what I would define as wonder. And that is common. It starts in wonder, not method. It starts with that awe and desire to pursue that sense of wonder, love, love of nature. So I think what Meek has presented is not only philosophically robust, but also very human. The place that she says that she found truth that accounts for coming to know in such a way which unites head and heart, values um, and facts, reason and faith, thought and emotion, is in the person of Jesus himself. Now, it might sound a little bit odd, you know, to try and crowbar Jesus into, into this at such a place. But she and others have said that such an approach to truth doesn't depersonalize truth. It personalizes truth. So it doesn't depersonalize Jesus, thinking of him like this. It personalizes truth. Truth is personal. That is why we feel so badly the lies of friends and governments the deceptions and fake information, the propaganda and the spin. That is why we find it difficult to trust in a post-truth context, because these person sources of truth have let us down. So what if, what if Jesus really is, as he claims to be, the way, the truth, and the life? What if knowing him actually enables us to know better, as me claims? What if the kind of epistemology that Meek is tapping into is provided by Jesus in such a way that he unites thinking, loving, and doing, but it's ultimately fueled by love? What Meek has set out for, for us makes sense of Jesus saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. What if there is a better way of knowing, loving with hearts, souls, strengths, and minds. And what if truth is ultimately revealed to us by God, the Father, by him sending the Son and the Spirit? What if that 
he is how we know truth. But hey, you know, maybe you're thinking, this could just be another lovely post-truth claim. It's just an outright lie that sounds so good that people just go for it. You know, G.K. Chesterton, a wonderful author, he once wrote that Christianity satisfies the mythological search for romance by being a story and the philosophical search for truth by being a true story. With confidence, then, I can say that Jesus is truth because he's entered the broken system and revealed a better way. He is the ultimate outsider and anti-establishment voice. His isn't a private truth claim for personal gain, but an open public truth claim that he backed up with his own life, his own death, and his own resurrection. He is there to be tested, scrutinized, and investigated. God cares about truth because he is truth. And this personal truth in Jesus is able to make sense of and account for the longings of our hearts, thoughts of our minds, and provide us with confidence in our knowing. So please do take these accounts of Jesus' life on your table. Be reading them, examining them. See who Jesus says he is. Does he actually stand up to scrutiny? Very quickly, I'm finishing now. Is there truth post-truth? Yes, because we can have confidence that Jesus, if he is truth, knows all things certainly. And he invites us as knowers to know the known and our journey of knowing so that we can understand things truly but perhaps not as exhaustively as we'd like to. If Jesus is truth personified, he isn't an arrogant truth claim, a mistaken truth claim that undermines other ways of knowing. He alone provides the basis and fuel for them all. We need someone, we need something to stand up for, but we also want someone to stand on. So Gobi's right. We don't want experts who will lord it over us. We want someone who stoops and serves. And that is the kind of truth that Jesus presents us with. Okay, there's much to say. This is the tip of the iceberg. Please ask questions. I finished. I've probably run over way over time. Really sorry. You've got one minute. Perhaps chat to the person next to you. See if there are any questions. What do you disagree with? What do you think? Oh, that sounds a bit interesting. I'd like to know more. And then I'm going to come back in about 30 seconds and um, answer a question. Hi everyone, um, we run slightly over, um, so we're not going to actually have time to do a question now, but um, in the second um, lunch bar there's plenty of time to keep discussing and asking questions, so do stick around for that if you can. Um, just want to say massive thank you to you all for being here, um, thanks to Christy as well. Um, you have feedback forms on your table, um, if you could fill them in, we'd love to hear your feedback. Um, if one of these boxes applies to you as well, 
Um, please do check one of them. Um, if you want to talk to someone from the CU more about stuff, if you have questions, then fill in your information. Um, but you don't have to tick one of these tick boxes. You can just leave feedback. Um, these, these books are on your tables. Um, they're free to take. They're an eyewitness account of the life of Jesus. Um, and they have questions in the back that you can be thinking through things. So um, please do take these and read um, through these. Um, if you hear people saying uncover Mark, that's what these are. If you feel a, a bit intimidated maybe by that resource, there are opportunities to go through it in groups on the Uncover More course, which hopefully you'll have leaflets for on your tables, which is over the rest of term. Um, you'll meet up, have maybe some pizza at the start, and then work through one of the studies in there. Also, there are plenty of resources over there on the Uncover More stand where all of the books and everything on there is absolutely free, but please do not take the actual table away. <laughs> um, if you've been shaken by this talk, maybe like the tent has been shaken by the wind, then you can stay after for the next hour where um, we'll have a panel who you can ask questions to and we'll also have some cake. But if you do have lectures, uh, do feel free to actually go to them. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>